your eyes and think of Paris. The city of lights, romance, cobbled streets, and fashionable French men and women with their baguettes, puffing on cigarettes and drinking espresso, right? How many of you have ever actually been to Paris? Oh, quite a few here, that's great. <laughs> how well does this description line up with your experience? And more specifically, how many of you have experienced Paris syndrome? Paris syndrome is said to be a psychological condition of tourists who experience severe disappointment when the city of lights does not live up to their overly romantic expectations. Often described as an extreme case of culture shock, sufferers of Paris syndrome have presented in an acute delusional state, suffering anywhere from hallucinations to anxiety, dizziness and sweating. Now, you might laugh, but this is actually a very real condition documented by medical journals. <laughs> Google it. And whilst it might seem like a pretty crazy phenomenon, um, this idea of a void between expectation and reality is not really that unexpected. If you think back to any time that you have travelled somewhere for the first time, before you've even begun to pack your suitcase, your mind has already been busy at work daydreaming and constructing an image of an unknown destination, but using only whatever information you happen to have in front of you. In the case of Paris syndrome, Highly romantic images of Paris and France in the mass media and Hollywood might have something to answer for. Well, to those sufferers of Paris syndrome out there, I empathise with you. Whilst as a naive 18-year-old backpacker, I actually really enjoyed Paris, um, I experienced a different strain of this syndrome, a kind of reverse Paris syndrome, when I moved here to the Torhoka region about five years ago. So in the Australian summer, uh, autumn actually, <laughs> of 2013, I was a shortlisted candidate on the JET program, which is a popular program for English teaching and international exchange here in Japan. And I spent many anxious weeks refreshing my inbox as I awaited to hear news of where I would be calling home for the next one to five years of my life. Until finally, one day, the email was there. And with one click, the answer was in front of me. One click. Fukushima Prefecture. <laughs> and with a bit of a double check and a gulp as I considered how my family might digest this news, um, I did what I'm pretty sure all JET candidates do. I jumped onto Google to get a visual, and I was confronted with images like these. And I can guarantee that um, even today, if you were to pull out your phone and to Google the word Fukushima, um, images like these would be the first to pop up in your search results. But at the time, you know, I also did my research and I had the word of my fellow jets in Fukushima to assure me that, of course, I wasn't being sent somewhere that would jeopardise my safety. But um, the image that I was developing in my mind of my new home couldn't help but be uh, impacted by such negative imagery and this kind of omnipresent fear-mongering media which painted Fukushima as some kind of nuclear wasteland. But over the next uh, three fantastic years of my life, I discovered a very different reality. Fukushima Prefecture is one of the most naturally beautiful, culturally rich and fascinating places I've ever had the pleasure to visit, let alone um, the pleasure of calling my second home. And this disparity between um, the image that I had in my mind before arriving and this reality that I now knew, um, it was so great that whilst maybe I didn't experience any hallucinations or physical symptoms, my Tohoku syndrome manifested in a very strong sense of injustice. And I became incredibly frustrated every time yet another clickbait doom and gloom article would pop up on my newsfeed, um, painting what is a very tragic situation inside the evacuation zone as somehow representative of the entire prefecture. And this is despite the reality that um, the evacuation zone covers less than 3% of what is actually Japan's third largest prefecture, which is a huge area. But it's this association of the word Fukushima with such negative imagery and connotation which continues to hinder the recovery of the region and its people. 
Farmers across Fukushima, um, as far away as Aizu, continue to battle against negative stigma. And it's this stigma which is prolonging import restrictions on Fukushima's produce in some, I think, 28 countries, even seven years down the track. And of course, it's also having a huge impact on tourism. Um, not just of Fukushima, of course, but of the Tohoku region as a whole. So those of you who were here last year might remember the answer to this question, but of the millions of tourists who are coming to Fukushima every year, and this figure is booming, by the way, um, what percentage do you think actually choose to stay here in the Tohoku region? Now, none of these numbers are particularly awe-inspiring, um, but you might be surprised to learn that it's actually less than 1%. And whilst this number is slowly improving, um, it's still a pretty shocking figure to get your head around. But one solution, I believe, lies in Paris syndrome. Now, I'm not suggesting that we go to Paris and collect the disillusioned tourists and bring them back here to Tohoku, um, but what we might be able to do is to try and alter this image of Tohoku in the minds of potential tourists. So in my mind, a potential tourist will construct an image of a destination based on three main sources of information. Word of mouth communication, tourism marketing and the mass media. In other words, this uh, collective information becomes a kind of blueprint for uh, developing an image of a destination. And when we look at Tohoku and it's only 1% of international tourists, we can, conclude one of two, uh, we can draw one of two conclusions. Either um, there really is nothing here to see in Tohoku, or this blueprint is somehow out of balance. In my experience, a failure to mobilise a very valuable source of this word-of-mouth communication, coupled with uninformed tourism media, um, tourism marketing is putting up little fight against this kind of sensationalist mass media, or at least a lack of accurate information presented in the mass media. As a result, um, the image of Tohoku in the minds of many either does not reflect reality or simply does not yet exist. But all is not lost, however. Just like a physical structure, an image is something that can be constructed, it is something that can be destroyed, but it is also something that can be rebuilt. All that we need is the right blueprint. So, where do we start? Well, in an age of uh, 4K cameras and drones, it can be quite easy to overlook the slightly less sophisticated tools of our mouths, um, but they should not be underestimated. It has been shown that when we're umming and ahhing about our next holiday destination, we pay a lot more attention to the real experience of those around us than we might do to, say, a multi-million dollar ad campaign on TV or information from official tourism bodies. In fact, it can be argued that this kind of word-of-mouth communication based on real experience um, is even more valuable to today's generation of millennial travellers thanks to the power of social media. We now have the power to share our personal experiences um, you know, instantaneously and directly with quite literally the world. But with only 1% of tourists coming here to Tohoku, the voices of those that make the journey here, um, they continue to be drowned out by the hordes of tourists coming to travel Japan's well-trodden golden route, which is you know, Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka and Hiroshima. Basically, we need backup. But the good news is, it exists right under our nose. So take a quick look around this room. Tourists are not the only internationals with the potential to share their experience of Tohoku. What about the 54,000 international residents who call Tohoku their second home? And these voices, even more so than tourists, um, they're really valuable because they have the unique ability to experience the region from both a global visitor's perspective as well as an insider who knows all of those kind of lo lo uh, um, you know, juicy local secrets. And for the past two years, I've had the pleasure of working with around 200 of these global locals, I guess you could say. Um, and this has been on a project called Go Go Tohoku. So in 2016, Sendai TV uh, developed the Tohoku Ambassador Club, which is a group of around 200 students, um, all living and studying here in Sendai, from around uh, 30 different countries. 
And this group was established to not only collect their experience of tohoku, but to provide a platform from which to share it with as many people as possible using this power of social media. So for the past two years, we have been travelling around Aomori, Akita, Iwate, Miyagi, Yamagata and Fukushima, meeting with locals and sharing our experiences of tohoku um, in both English as well as the native language of each student. And whilst um, Gogo Tohoku still might have a little way to go before we reach the widest possible audience, um, this, uh, our platforms have kind of become a window into both local life and travel in Tohoku based on this real experience, on this word of mouth communication. But you know, this is still only um, 200 voices of some 54,000. So can you imagine the impact that we could have if all international residents became um, active ambassadors for Tohoku? But you know, this also works both ways. Whilst we can do what we can as international residents, um, Tohoku also needs to get out there, pack its bags and sell itself. Which brings me to our second shocking statistic. Um, of the 9 million Tohoku residents, what percentage do you think actually own a passport? And you might be surprised, but um, the six prefectures of Tohoku have some of the lowest rates for passport holders in the whole of Japan. In fact, only 12% own a passport. And of those, less than 5% actually ventured outside of Japan in uh, 2016. Now, coming from one of the world's most underappreciated capital cities, Canberra, um, I can't count the number of times that I have travelled overseas um, to discover new places, but instead found myself educating the general populace of the existence of my hometown, as well as hopefully convincing one or two to come and visit one day. But who's there to stand up for Tohoku when 88% of the population hasn't even filled out their passport application? And some of those 88% might argue, well, why tourism anyway? You know, why not keep a secret a secret? Well, it is no secret that uh, many of Japan's rural communities, and many of those happen to be located in Tohoku, um, they're faced with a rapidly ageing population. And entire communities are disappearing as young people leave the countryside to find employment in the cities. But if only active use could be made of Tohoku's fantastic natural beauty, its lively summer festivals, or its, you know, its off-the-charts gastronomical scene, um, tourism might hold the key to attracting business, creating jobs, and hopefully solving some of these wider social issues. But none of this is possible as long as much of the world still fails to identify Tohoku on a map. So please, Tohoku, take a holiday. <laughs> Get out there. <laughs> Please, and sell yourself. Um, if not for yourself, please do it for your grandchildren. Or better yet, take them with you. Back to the blueprint. So I'm going to ask you one more time to please close your eyes. And this time, think of your own hometown. If you had to name one attraction, just one place, thing, or event that you would name as the top attraction, what would it be? And do you think that an outside visitor would come up with the same answer? Often what a local considers to be an attraction might not be the case for someone viewing through a different cultural lens, and vice versa. Sometimes um, the best attractions can be found in the most surprising of places. So our travels with Gogo Tohoku have been a huge source of surprise for many locals who are astonished to find that after a two-day trip um, the highlight was actually not the, you know, ranked fourth best in Japan yakisoba or a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but simply um, making gesture fueled uh, communication at a farm stay or participating in a local festival. And for me, this is where Tohoku's strength really lies. Hidden within the everyday lifestyle and culture is a side of Japan that is, it's remained unspoilt for centuries and offers huge potential for tourists um, to gain that highly sought after, you know, hashtag authentic real Japan experience. It might just take locals a second look from an international perspective to discover the hidden potential within what to them is their everyday. And finally, let's take a look at a map of Tohoku. 
So those of us who live here will understand very well that these lines represent prefectural borders. And those of us who work in tourism marketing will understand that these lines are more than just geographical, but actually the basis upon which um, a lot of government resources are distributed, and usually on a yearly basis. Now, not only does this make implementing anything ongoing quite a challenge, um, more than anything else, it encourages a very parochial perspective. So whilst we're over here in our prefectural bubbles, um, you know, worrying about budgets and borderlines, do you really think that international tourists, travellers, are paying any attention? Do these lines mean anything to them? Let's instead consider what they might see looking at the same region. And if you were a traveller um, looking for your next holiday destination, what would be more appealing to you? A map of six separate areas, all kind of vaguely offering the best of everything, or a core collection of unique and exciting attractions, all within relatively easy travelling distance. Instead of working as isolated prefectures, it would be much more beneficial for the region to try to look beyond these municipal borders, to work together and engage both locals and international residents who work within them, to first identify which of these attractions are going to bring people here in the first place. And by focusing our promotion on these core attractions, perhaps then we will have the capacity to make it easier to travel between them. In the words of the late Stephen Hawking, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. And such illusions, whether it be you know, a highly romantic image of Paris or overly sensationalist media, these illusions are not going to go anywhere as long as there is an interest in consuming them. But if we can only turn our attention to these more genuine sources of information and more me uh, effective methods of communication, perhaps then we will have a chance of balancing the blueprint. And with this blueprint, anyone can uh, construct an image of Tohoku which reflects the incredible reality that it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Arigatou gozaimasu.